Um, so <laughs> so um, it's nice to see some of you virtually. Uh, and yeah, we're just looking forward to sharing results of this project. It was originally funded by the Second Century Fellowship um, through me, but I brought Dominique onto this project in her beginning of her undergraduate career here at UMaine. And now, in fact, this week, Dominique is gonna be graduating um, from the Honors College with a degree in political science and a minor in ecology and environmental sciences. And I'll embarrass her by saying she's also a UMaine valedictorian this year. Um, so I don't need to tell you that she did an excellent job. You'll see about the results today. She took a lead on the data collection as well as the research analysis and the publication summarizing these results that's currently in review and we hope to hear back about within the next couple of weeks. Um, Dominique, we are lucky to have her staying on in Maine next year. She'll be working on food waste solutions with uh, the Maine DEP and then going on to study environmental law as a Truman Scholar ultimately. Um, so this isn't even the only real world environmental challenge that Dominique has been working on here uh, in the state of Maine, but we're lucky to get to see her for a few more years at least. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dominique to summarize our work over the last few years. Thank you, everybody. I can't tell you how nice it is to be able to wrap this up with a big red bow uh, since Kate mentioned that I've been working on this since freshman year. So it feels really great just three days out from commencement to be able to share these results with you. Um, all right. Does this look good? Can you guys see my screen? Cool. All right. So um, as Kate mentioned, um, we uh, just submitted a article for review in Ecology and Society. So this is the title of our article, Stakeholder Groups Exhibit Varying Preferences for Freshwater Resource Management in Acadia National Park. I worked on this article with um, Kate and also with Adam Gibson, who is thankfully here as well. And it's been just a, a lovely experience and also got some really good findings. So I'm happy to talk about that. Um, and I noticed a few of you have actually probably heard the first couple slides before. Um, and so thank you for hanging tight. Maybe this is a refresher. Um, but yeah. So why? Our specific projects emerged from interest in looking at um, stakeholder perspectives of freshwater resource management because we're seeing increasing usage of protected lands, especially in Acadia. And this means that we're having a potential for conflict, uh, as we saw with the Jordan Pond really being painted gray and with non-native bait fish being introduced into our streams. There's some contention between uh, emerging stakeholder groups uh, about how to use these freshwater resources, what they're there for, um, what are the most important priorities, all of that stuff. Um, we need more information as our stakeholder um, groups change, as our visitors change um, just by, you know, the increasing usage and um, kind of shifting in demographics of the state of Maine overall, um, getting a pulse for how their priorities are shifting, especially when it relates to water, um, seeing that there are multiple uses of water, both recreational and then ecological integrity, and also as like drinking supplies for uh, local municipalities. So it's a very crucial resource. And also seeing stakeholder knowledge. So do folks actually understand um, perhaps why, uh, why we can't um, have swimming in certain lakes because they're, you know, drinking supplies and whatnot, and other um, knowledge of just the resource in general, and also Acadia National Park's role in in stewarding that resource. And this also comes at a time where we're seeing shifting baselines. So um, Acadia National Park, as we see it today, uh, even with you know our best efforts, is not going to look the same in 20 or 30 years. And this is reflected um, in the national park systems sort of slightly moving to a new interpretation of their mission statement that goes away from preservation. So seeing a place the way it was a century ago or two centuries ago, um, and more of really stewarding those resources so they remain resilient and intact, um, even if they look slightly different um, as a result of climate change. Um, and also shifting baselines in these needs and interests as we have new political landscapes, as we have new, um, as we need new strategies to uh, have adaptive management for these resources. Um, all of those things are constantly changing and getting a baseline, a new baseline um, can be really helpful. So how we did this is we employed intercept surveys 
pre-COVID, um, I went around, some of you might have seen me way, way back when, um, with a clipboard or an iPad, um, asking folks at Scudic events and at Acadia National Park to take a survey. Um, and then post-COVID, um, right, because we our collection period was right around fall uh, 2019 to the end of the summer 2020. Um, so when COVID hit uh, the state of Maine and everything closed around March, we really had to pivot because we were planning on really launching our uh, in-person surveys that summer. So by pivoting, we um, thought critically about the stakeholder groups that we wanted to target, which you'll see on the next slide, and how to get at those stakeholders. So um, we did a couple different things. One of them was creating this flyer and putting it on sandwich boards around uh, the Acadia National Park with the help of a couple other student volunteers who would move it every day. Um, so one day it would be a Cadillac, the another day it would be at Jordan Pond. And we got a pretty robust response by doing that. And to target local residents, we reached out to local libraries in the municipalities nearby to circulate it through their listservs. Um, um, and put the flyers up in the libraries. And we're also really satisfied with the response we got from that. So I think with all of the pivoting, we did, we did a pretty good job. Um, and the questions that we targeted specifically for the article, uh, we're looking at asking about Acadia National Park's freshwater resources, how they should be used, and how we think about prioritization, which I'll get into a little bit next. So as I mentioned, for the article, we focused on three particular questions. So the first question, uh, the first two actually, are different versions of the same question. So this, um, this one that is on the screen now is a five-point Likert scale that went from strongly disagree to strongly agree and asked folks to indicate their agreement level with um, water resources in Acadia National Park should be managed to and you all can see the list of uh, 10 options here. And this was just general agreement to just kind of parse out uh, people's general support for these items. Um, and then the second version of the question was the same question, but we asked them to rank. So half of the sample got the first version and half of the sample got the second. So folks um, only got one version of the, of the question. And for this question, people had to think critically about what is a higher priority than the other? And the reason we asked this question is because we wanted to, you know, it's, we had a feeling <laughs> that folks find, may find it very easy to say, oh, I agree with all of these things. But um, when thinking about limited resource capacity, both financially and staff time, people do have to make trade off decisions. Um, and also um, having something that can show us where people's priorities lie, you know, what's more important to people than something else um, could be really helpful in tailoring communication and just overall guiding uh, missions and, and goals and how we uh, approach things. And one great example would be the transportation plan. Um, so results from this could help us think about how to talk about the transportation plan instead of just like you know, uh, a transportation plan to limit congestion, we can talk about the ecological impacts, uh, which I'll get into a little bit later, but um, it really helps kind of shift those communication strategies. And then the third one was a really practical question, right? Um, so we asked people um, what, how they think these activities should be managed in Acadia National Park. And this just helps get a pulse of, of what people think should and shouldn't be allowed. We um, gave them the option of open, limited, or prohibited for each of these. And this was helpful both to see where people are at, but to see where gaps are in policy. And these gaps help us take a look at, you know, um, are they thinking, you know, something should be different than what the actual regulations are because there's a lack of information? Or is it based on stakeholder group, you know, asking those kinds of questions. And we found some really good data with this question as well. So those were the three questions we focused on. And at the end of our survey period, we collected 589 surveys uh, representing seven stakeholder groups. Uh, the bulk of these groups were collapsed down for small size, but as you can see on this pie chart here, uh, uh, the majority is visitors and then a decent chunk is local residents. And while, um, 
we got a ton of visitors. We, we think that's pretty representative of the overall population because visitors outnumber locals and researchers by a lot. Um, so I think we think we got a really good representative sample. And then you'll see educators, researchers, students, natural resource managers, and environmental uh, NGOs, environmental stewards. We ended up um, collapsing environmental stewards and natural resource managers into one group. And um, then we ended up eliminating educators and students and uh, researchers in our final re results analysis, just because there were they were really low numbers identifying as that. And looking back, it makes a lot of sense because when we think about stakeholder group identity, a researcher can identify as a natural resource manager and as a local. And so uh, when I had the opportunity to survey people in person, they had to like kind of choose which hat to put on when answering the survey. So we don't think a ton of data was was lost with that. All right, and then this uh, gorgeous graph, which uh, Adam, I think Adam suggested, if I remember correctly, you're going to see a lot of it, but I promise it's, I'll walk you through it. It'll be great. Um, so this graph was of a result specifically for those first two questions that I uh, mentioned. So as you can see here, um, there are dots for each of the 10 um, values that I mentioned earlier. And on the y axis, you see the Likert response. So this is people's general agreement level. So the higher you are, the more they agree. Nobody generally disagreed with any of the um, values, which I think is important to note and also kind of gets at our idea of the difference between general support and um, actually ranking and prioritizing. So on the x-axis here, you can see where people put their priorities. So for this to the right is highest priority and for this to the left is lowest priority. So the cool thing that we notice almost immediately is there's a cluster of of groups of values right here that are pretty indicative of like high values for ranking and for uh, agreement levels and their ecological values, which I think is pretty cool. So like wildlife and intact ecosystems ranked really, really high. Um, and so that can help us uh, think about, you know, priorities and understanding how to um, communicate that maybe generally if we communicate about preserving our ecosystems and um, making sure that our wildlife are safe, that that can be a really successful goal to reach um, a broad amount of stakeholders. And another one, and perhaps the most important one is that this varies by context, big time. So, and I think you can see that from a couple different um, places over here on here. One excellent example is that tourism was generally pretty agreed with. No, you know, we didn't have too much uh, problem with people disagreeing that uh, resources should be used to support tourism. But when we asked folks to rank it, it was across the board the lowest ranked item. Like out of 10, I think the average was like 9.6 or something like that. So it really shows that while, you know, folks can generally agree with, well, yeah, you know, it should support the tourism in industry. When we're thinking about how to use our limited resources, um, this is kind of an assurance that it's okay to put, you know, ecological values over supporting the tourism industry if that's gonna keep our ecosystems intact and all of that. So that was, kind of an assuring finding. Another interesting one is we can look at values like research, drinking water, and wildlife that were all ranked pretty much the same in terms of general values, like general agreement, but they were ranked drastically differently when it came to high, the priorities. So research was, value, was prioritized um, last out of the three, and then drinking water, and then wildlife. So Again, this this alone really demonstrates the how helpful it is to look at things uh, in terms of how people generally support it, but also take a look at that prioritization and trade offs when we have to make trade off decisions and how to use our time and energy. And this gets a little bit at the rabbit hole Adam put us down of the cognitive hierarchy, where um, we can think really broadly and have like really broad values in um, kind of thousand foot perspectives on things. Uh, but when the rubber meets the road, there can be a really big difference between the two. So and that comes out to play almost perfectly when we look at our results for tourism, 
uh, folks generally supported that um, our resources should be allocated to support the tourism industry in Acadia National Park. But when the rubber meets the road and perhaps they're thinking about the mission of, of the National Park and maybe why they went there themselves and what it means to them, it's a lower priority um, because those other values outweigh. And so this was really helpful for kind of framing our analysis and, and taking a look at um, some in at first glance, what can be really dizzying results because things maybe don't add up or seem contradictory. But when we take a look at it, it can actually be really helpful for understanding how things are nuanced and vary depending on context. And maybe we can understand that uh, better to guide our communication strategies. Another thing we found is that there are policy gaps. So, um, sorry. <laughs> so one excellent example is that activities question I showed you. Um, pretty much all of the other questions, jet skiing, uh, recreational fishing, commercial fishing, all of those were perfectly in line with the um, Acadia's regulations. Um, and so that was assuring again, but swimming was not. Swimming was pretty, um, split in terms of whether people thought that it should be um, more restricted or less restricted. So visitors and MDI residents preferred less restrictions on swimming in Acadia National Park. And this uh, is in contrast with what the actual policies are. So swimming is prohibited. If this is wrong, you guys are the ones to point it out, but I'm pretty sure it's right. Uh, swimming is prohibited in six out of seven freshwater lakes in Acadia National Park. So this shows a policy gap that could be, you know, driven by maybe they don't understand why it's prohibited, maybe they don't care. Um, but getting thinking about how we can close that gap, if we can close that gap, um, whether that be through more education, similar to the sign, or maybe through like negotiating ways that uh, swimming could be more loud. Just it's a point to look at, especially since I think this uh, really highlights areas for non-compliance and contention um, because there is this gap between what people want or think should be and what it currently is. And so perhaps the most compelling result um, and definitely one of the most novel findings of this research is that stakeholder group uniquely uh, stakeholder group identity uniquely influences preferences. So when we looked at the literature, um, it has been something that kind of we, we all know implicitly, right? Like people's relationships to resources change how they view resources should be managed. You know, somebody, a uh, fisherman will have completely different views than like a climate change activist or something like that, or maybe not, you know, but we have this kind of implicit sense that um, maybe a visitor out of state will have very different um, perspectives of resource management than somebody who lives right next door to Acadia. And so, but the, we, there's not a lot of uh, literature really empirically demonstrating that. So part of this analysis, I spent a lot of time in R, very thankful for Kate for working with that. Um, and looking at you know comparing it to gender comparing it to educational status and comparing it to another one that i forget i think it was age um and across the board there were some you know gender uh definitely influenced it and that's borne out in the literature as well but stakeholder identity influenced more variables and in different ways so completely different from the ways gender and age influence um, people's preferences. So that's a really exciting finding. Um, and it, as much as it already backs up what a lot of us are practicing and know, um, I think that's helpful. Can you guys still hear me? Because the street sweeper is outside. OK, good. <laughs> Thanks. So that's pretty much the end of my presentation. Um, Please stay tuned for our article. It is in review right now, and we're excited to hear back from reviewers about some edits and then moving on. And it should come out of ecology and society. But that is all I have. And I'm just, again, thankful for this opportunity and very excited for any questions you guys may have. Great, thank you so much. Uh, sorry, I had my video off because the internet connection here at headquarters is not great. So, but yes, thank you. That was, that was excellent. Um, we had one question, and I think, I think uh, Dr. Ruskin addressed that. Are there any other questions? 
feel free to come off a of mute or raise your hand, or you can type it in the chat if you have any questions. Dominique, would you mind going back to your big figure? Um, I think that'll help remind people of, of the sort of nuanced relationship between the two different ways of asking questions. Absolutely. Thanks. Whoops. <clears throat> there we go. I, this is very, I have a question. Just, just, just kind of a very basic, like, what, what surprised you most about the results that you, that you found? That, or, or are these pretty much in line with what you were expecting? One yeah. comes to mind for me, Dominique. Would you mind if I jump in and then yeah, I'll turn it over to you? Um, we, so one part of the analysis that wound up hitting the cutting room floor, but was in the early stages was using an index to calculate consensus. Um, and as Dominique summarized, we found that which stakeholder group you were in, um, in was, was the most common predictor of what your management preference was. But what I found really surprising and interesting was that the, that relationship changed depending on how we asked the question. So Dominique used the tourism example where when you were talking about just support and how supportive using the Likert scale, um, you know, stakeholders were of tourism, that was one example where the stakeholder groups differed. Uh, visitors were more supportive of using water resources for tourism than locals were in particular. However, that disagreement disappeared when you looked at it in terms of ranking. And then across all the stakeholder groups, all groups ranked tourism as the lowest priority on average. So I think that was the biggest surprise for me. And I think one of the coolest takeaways is that the consensus or lack thereof depends on the context in which you ask the question. Yeah, similarly, I the the lit review was the most annoying part of this project for me, as I'm sure is the case for a lot of people. Um, but when I actually did the research and noticed that there isn't a lot of empirical data, um, if any, uh, looking at uh, stakeholder identity as the primary driver, again, even though it's borne out in like pedagogy and how we approach things. Um, that was really cool. That was a really cool moment for me as the student researcher to be like, whoa, did I just find something that nobody else has found? Maybe. Um, so that was that was really cool. All right, we've got a, a question from Becca. She says, if you were to conduct the same study again, what would you change? I think maybe I would have started out with less stakeholder groups. I do think um, maybe researcher and student and educator could parse it out, but in hindsight, looking at like the questions that we were asking, I think um, maybe just restricting it to natural resource manager and visitor and local residents would probably be best. And especially in those early stages when we were doing paper surveys, I think it would have kind of streamlined it for folks to think about what hat they were putting on in a much narrower context. I have kind of a similar question. You know, I find whenever you make a survey, there you can't ask as many questions as you want, right? There's always questions you leave behind. So, sort of, where should we go next? Are there are there questions that you didn't ask you'd like to ask, or, or some other direction you'd like to go next? Yeah, I think I think there could be a lot of utility about asking more specific questions in future surveys. So we've seen we've this survey kind of like piloted that, you know, people's preferences and perspectives do change based on the context we ask them. So like, for example, the transportation plan might be a great example of where the survey could go, asking questions about the transportation plan in different contexts and kind of really parsing out, you know, um, are people in support of this scenario versus this scenario, or maybe we talk about it like this, are they, you know, in favor comparative to that, you know, so I think looking at this kind of broader, perhaps more vague um, survey, which 
establish that that's going to like their perspectives are going to change. Um, there's a real opportunity to look at more specific policies and, and get some data for that. Along those lines, I'd like to test the communication strategies. So, you know, how deploy summit stewards with two different types of clipboards, one with framing about how the transportation, the reservation system allows everyone to have a solitary experience and, uh, you know, enjoy the park in the way they'd like to. A different one where it's about ecological integrity and protecting the habitat up there and the wildlife and then test how, whether there's a difference in terms of how visitors' perceptions are based on the framing that they've received in the communication from the park. And Dominique, can you talk a little bit about um, another one of the questions that hit the cutting room floor about the, the like timeline management thing too? Because I feel like we had some slightly interesting results, but not as, they weren't as different by stakeholder group as we'd expected. We wound up cutting it for the manuscript. Yeah, so excuse me, because I'm totally going to have to pull it up because <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's been a little bit. But we asked two versions of the same question um, and 50% went to one group and 50% went to the other. And one version of the question was asking about, um, so basically our idea was, was trying to parse out support uh, for different kinds of management strategies. So the first one being a preservation kind of model where we're preservation in the sense of returning to a baseline of history, you know, like how things looked long, long ago. So one example was uh, dissolved organic carbon content in lakes. And so there have been, there were some studies out there that um, suggested that uh, Kitty National Park's lakes were clearer in uh, the past and are not any longer because there's a higher dissolved organic carbon content. And so we asked folks to respond um, whether they would like to return back to a scenario where the waters are clear um, or whether they would like to just have things continue into the future with an uncertain result or uh, kind of regulate perhaps through the use of chemicals, I think we explicitly suggested um, what the lakes look right now and try to preserve this moment in history. Um, and we did end up cutting it for the manuscript, but let me pull up the results real quick. I think we, we asked another version of the question that was about um, landlocked Fish. salmon as well, which we found out was incorrect. Yeah. But um, the big picture goal was trying to figure out what time target are people aiming for in terms of how resources are managed? Do they want to preserve what was, preserve what is, or manage for resilience and acknowledging change, adapting to that change? Um, so I'll allow Dominique to kind of summarize what we found there in terms of, I think we found that stakeholder group was not commonly a predictor, yeah. didn't divide people on yeah. that question. So pardon these, these slightly unprofessional figures, but this was really, really early results um, where our sample size, I think was only 50 people, but I think these were borne out in the larger sample uh, size. And what we found is with the water clarity question, people were pretty much on the same page uh, where they, they don't really care about <laughs> uh, apparently the waters, they are like, just let it change. Um, but when we asked about fishing, it was more contentious. So that I think that again, we we were going to include it in the manuscript as a sub point to suggest that again things vary on context. So here, when we're talking about fish, people have different opinions about whether or not you should continue to stock the fishery or let you know the the population fluctuate. Um, and but when you ask about dissolved organic carbon, maybe they don't care as much. Um, so. Yeah, these were just the preliminary results, but I, I do remember what Kate was saying is correct, where when we actually looked at trying to parse it out based on stakeholder group, there wasn't much of a difference. And that's because we think, you know, what underlies these stakeholder differences that we did see in terms of preference for management is how people are interacting with the resource and on what time scale. So, you know, a local is going to care about 
how, uh, you know, a pond is managed over the course of their lifetime, as opposed to just for the few hours or days that they're there in the park. Um, so we, we think that would be cool to dive into further. Unfortunately, that we struggled a little bit with scenarios that we'd find comparable so that it didn't turn into too much of an ecology 101 lesson to try to ask the question. Um, but we think there's some probably interesting and nuanced patterns probably to be had there as well. Sarah, please go ahead. I have a question. Yeah, um, I love the, the the thought about the time targets. Um, and I, I think this is a, a question for both of you, but also um, maybe park folks who are the, who are around. Um, it, aren't there, is there a specific like mandated period of time that's like considered the culturally important historical time when we when we think about resources um, back back in time? Um, and then and then is there is there like a future time frame that is part of like the park mandate anyway. Like I, I, it seems like that this time thing comes up um, and it's either really loose like for whenever or there's these like set things that are part of the old preserve and protect thing. So I, I don't know if you can talk about that or someone here can, that'd be great, thanks. What we know is that there's recently come out guidance that is more pointing toward, you know, managing for resilience, um, but I'll allow parks person to step in about what that historical target is. My guess is it varies by park, but um, I'd love to hear from you. We've got a few people on the line that, that could maybe chime in if they care to, Rebecca, Brandon, Dale. I don't know if any of you would like to talk about that, that in terms of managing timelines past and, and future. Oh, okay. My guess is it's a very tough question. Um, and I imagine that there's disagreement um, out there. It's, you know, National Park Service is just so interesting how it's steward for both natural resources and cultural resources as evidenced by like vastly different properties from Yellowstone to like presidential birthplaces. And um, anyway, that's just a, a tricky proposition, I think. I think the safest answer is always, it depends. Yeah, depends and both. The resource, it depends on, yeah. <laughs> I'm right, curious for those in the question, park. I, that was an excellent question though, because I, I think you stumped us. That's why nobody wants to chime in. <laughs> well, it seems I'm hard curious. to plan for surveying and like your questions if you know you need to know what, what time I would, it's just a great question. I'm glad you brought it up as time targets. I think that's a really nice way to phrase it. Anyway, thank you. I'm curious, what all has surprised you all who work in the park uh, so much in terms of these results? Is any of it surprising? Is it just nice to see things that you suspected sort of demonstrated quantitatively? I mean, just speaking for myself, that that's always, I think it's always a huge value when we do survey research like this. There's so much anecdotal information, you know, that, that we use and that we <clears throat> base decisions on. And even things that we say, oh, that's such an obvious question. Well, yeah, it, it might be, but we don't have any empirical data. Uh, I, I, not that I don't think that these questions were obvious. I think that they they were definitely novel questions, and then getting at them in a novel way, even. But but yeah, I mean, I, I do. I, I think all surveys that happen in the park hold a lot of value and and are always really interesting, and and it's great to to build on each other. Uh, and uh, like Dr. Ruskin was saying, that I think and the excellent next step would be to look at messaging. I think those studies, there's not a lot of them that are out there. I know, and the ones that, that do happen are really interesting. There was one that took place in um, uh, Sequoia Kings Canyon where they get a lot of military overflights. And there was some messaging strategies that were tested where when people know why those overflights are, are happening and why they're getting these sort of negative visitor experiences from that. It really, the, the framing works. It does change people's perception of them and, and how they, they tolerate different impacts. And so, yeah, that, that would be an excellent next step to take. Speaking of messaging, just throwing this out there in case it's helpful for any of your efforts, 
we added a postcard incentive. Um, I just did this up in Photoshop to try and look like those great vintage park posters. And we think that was really effective. So we mailed people postcards after the fact and we, we didn't test for it because we were just desperate for all the surveys we could get, but it seemed like it was a pretty good incentive. Quite a few people did put in their address so we could send them a postcard. And, uh, you know, I know I should know the answer to this question, but did, did you look at differences between survey mode, like uh, online versus in person to see if there were differences in those two respondent populations or respondent samples? We didn't because they were so different. So okay. in before we went remote, those were kind of just pilot days where Dominique went down to the park. It was, was it fall or winter? There was snow on their ground, wasn't there? Well, it's Maine. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, I think I had one at the beginning of November and it maybe one at, at the beginning of October as well, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, those were just sort of tester days. That was the plan. And the plan was to launch over the summer. Um, so, but COVID hit in the meantime. So we found, we didn't, because we just thought those were so different. And, and another thing we did in person was do a brown bag. And so we'd also like to thank all of you, but probably most everybody on this call filled out the survey too. Um, and we appreciate your contributions. Um, that generated this data and these insights. Um, so yeah, we didn't do it. We'd like to. I also think, you know, on the free postcard idea, I think it would be more effective if there were somebody there handing out the postcard. And I've certainly found that having students on site saying, I'm a student, could you please take a survey? Definitely helps. Um, well, we just were not allowed to do that in 2020. It had to be, you know, masked, drop the sign and run. So we didn't really have the capacity to test um, treatments in that regard. All right, last chance for questions. Let's see, I don't, I don't see anything in the chat. I do have something completely different that I wanted to share too, while I have a captive parks interested audience. Um, so you might also remember that a few years ago in 2017, some students and I, different students, um, did a big survey at Scudic Woods, the new campground, and looking at bird diversity, vegetation diversity, um, carbon storage in the trees that were cut down for the campground and developments, and visitation to try and assess what the positive and negative impacts of putting in the campground were. Um, and speaking of anecdotes, you know, I've heard in the years since that the secret about Scudic is out. And the usage numbers have changed dramatically, but that's related in part to how they're collected. Um, but I've heard stories about how the campgrounds are more booked now, plus COVID's happened and we're renegotiating our relationship with the outdoors. So I had a student, um, we tossed in in 2020 when we were doing, no, I guess it was 2021. Um, we tossed in some of my old Scudic survey questions um, this last year to try and just take a very small snapshot to see if we could detect any indicators that the visitation to Scudic Woods or usage of it has shifted, say demographically. Um, and the short answer is we're not showing any signs, but I just want to show you a little one pager that I'll also email around to Abe and Adam and you can share as you like. Um, but comparing 2017 to 2021 in terms of the proportion of people who were there for day trips, versus overnight trips somewhere on Scudic, not just at Scudic Woods. The ratios were almost exactly the same. Um, we looked at where were people staying among those who were staying somewhere on the peninsula or in the area overnight. And again, quite similar. Note that the sample sizes at this point are really low um, because we trimmed the data so that they were really comparable. So just kind of focusing on mostly August, September um, based on some of the constraints of when we had collected the data. But I do, I think maybe there's a little something there where, um, you know, visitation has increased. The people who are interested in staying overnight has possibly increased, but the campground capacity hasn't grown. Um, so I think that could point toward there being an unmet need for overnight and specifically camping accommodations in the peninsula, if not specifically in the park, um, but in the area. Um, and then in terms of economic interactions, now we're talking again, really small sample sizes. So I would take all of that with a grain of salt, but on the whole, we're not seeing any strong evidence that who's using Scudic Woods, 
or how they're using Scudic Woods has shifted a lot in the five years, um, oh no, four years um, between these samples. But of course, I, I think there are a few, you know, hints that might suggest a resurvey is a good idea. Um, but yeah, not not strong indicators um, that things have shifted tremendously in terms of how people are using Scudic Woods. So I just want to share that totally different uh, work just while I've got uh, you all here. This is off, off the, the point, I think, but you said August and September. And from dealing with tourism in the park, uh, starting September, you get a lot more retirees who probably are less likely to be camping than people with kids. So that might affect when when the survey was taken might affect that. Um, but excellent pr presentation, thank you. Oh, thank you. Although I will note in, so we didn't go to this level of detail in 2021, but in 2017, one of the things we heard a lot was that um, campers at Scudic Woods, they brought up the, that there was no length limit for the RVs a lot. Um, so there seemed to be a lot of people who are really happy to bring their extra large rigs into Scudic Woods. And I think a lot of um, areas, and yeah, it's, it's interesting because we just hear all these anecdotes. Another thing I heard was that, uh, we heard a number of times was that there were a lot of empty campsites at Scudic Woods and people told us that because the retiree rate is lower, it essentially only costs you $5 a night to book six months in advance and then not show up. And so they said that there were a lot of people who would book a week at Acadia and then you know, their travels would take them to a totally different part of the country and they wouldn't cancel their reservation. Those are just anecdotes that we heard because in 2017, this was students walking around with clipboards every three nights. Um, so they heard a lot. They also heard a lot. Yeah, they heard people's opinions about their majors, about the University of Maine, about climate change. We got a lot of anecdotes that year. Whereas in 2021, we were using the sandwich boards in a few markets. That's another way in which the sample's not entirely comparable. Um, but uh, we just want to share it in case it yields any useful insights. The other really interesting anecdote from the 2017 data that, that Dr. Rustin had shared with me is the amount of people that had no idea they were staying off island, that were staying at Scudic. When they would, they would go online, they would book they would book a campground thinking it's you know going to be on MDI and it turns out being hope it's good. And uh, some of them were happy about that and some of them were not so happy about that. But I just think that that idea was was pretty interesting to show where their, their trip planning kind of failed. <laughs> I'll tell you something that just surprised me just a couple of weeks ago. So I've been to Skidik Peninsula a number of times and I studied the campground. I've walked the trails. I built, bring classes there. But for the very first time I biked all those gravel paths and I noticed the hills in a way that I never had before. I've been on every foot of them, but I didn't realize they were quite so hilly until I was trying to pedal my way up them. Uh, so anyway, that was interesting and it makes me curious too because it is a very bike friendly area, but some of those hills are not so easy uh, if you're not expecting them. <clears throat> all right, any other last minute questions? Okay. All right. Thank you so much. As you can see, they, they do a, a lot of research here in the park, and I'm sure we'll continue to do so. We really appreciate the work that they've been doing. So thank you very much. Glad We're looking forward to it. And thanks to everyone for all of your support for this research over the years and for listening today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you, guys. Bye. <clears throat>